Okay, welcome back uh, everyone for the second section of uh, this uh, series day. So we are very happy to have uh, Nicole uh, Imorlika uh, from uh, Microsoft Research uh, telling us about recharging bandits. And Thank this you. Is joint work with Bobby. Yeah, this is joint work with Bobby Kleinberg from Cornell. Um, okay, so I think we all here know uh, what the multi-arm bandit setup is. You have a bunch of arms. Each arm has a reward that you get when you choose to pull it, and the uh, reward is drawn from some unknown distribution. And your goal is to play around with the arms a bit until you, uh, you know, get a lot of uh, rewards out of the arms. And the thing about the standard setup here is that the distribution of the uh, reward of an arm is fixed over time. But in many settings of interest, the distribution is not fixed, but rather is a function of uh, the idle time since you last pulled the arm. So you might think, for example, about music. Uh, maybe you really love Nirvana, and uh, you're very excited to hear it, and if you haven't heard a uh, Nirvana song for the past week, you're getting anxious and you're, you're really missing it, and so you really want to hear a, a Nirvana song. Um, and so uh, this is going to be the extent of my motivation following Yuval's recommendation that <laughs> there not be any motivation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in the recharging bandit problem, the formalization that we have in this paper is that uh, the reward that you get from pulling an arm is a function of the delay since you last pulled it. Uh, so there's some function h sub i, which is the, uh, 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 the expectation of the reward that you get if you pulled it d days ago, last pulled the arm d days ago. And we're going to assume that this function is increasing, so rewards accumulate over time, and that it's concave, which uh, can be thought of as meaning that pulling an arm uh, in a time step when you anyway weren't doing anything is better for your payoff than not uh, pulling it. And again, your goal is to maximize your total expected payoff. So if I have a delay of like 10 days between two pulls of the arm, uh, and I could insert a pull of that arm in between the two pulls, and now I'll have two five-day delays, and that's better than having a 10-day delay. So uh, I'm going to discuss the problem, uh, you know, finding the optimal schedule of when to pull arms when I assume that these payoffs h sub i are known. Uh, this turns out to be a highly non-trivial problem, uh, unlike in multi-arm bandits, where uh, if you knew all of the rewards, you would just greedily pull the arm that gives you the best reward in every time step. Uh, and so after uh, solving this problem is going to be related to a uh, nice problem in combinatorics, which I'll have a short interlude about. It's got a fun open problem that I like to think about, uh, which you can, you can talk about in your canceled open problem session. Um, and then we'll return to solving the uh, known payoff setting. And then um, at the end of the talk, I'll discuss how to transform that into a learning algorithm for the case when these h functions are unknown and must be learned over time. All right, so the sort of first thing you might try is a greedy algorithm. At every time step, I can look at the reward I would get from, so I'm considering where I know the hi. So in every time step, I can just look at the delay since I last pulled each arm i. I understand uh, which one has the largest current reward for me. Just pull that arm. And this is a policy, greedy. Um, and I guess maybe it's not too surprising. I'm going to skip the uh, proof, but uh, it shouldn't be too surprising that this is not going to be optimal. Uh, there is a lower bound that we have in the paper showing that it can be arbitrarily close to one half. Um, yeah? So this function h is every day it is, told, uh, it is given to you. You don't know it in advance. This function h is fixed over time. Oh, it is fixed. Yeah. What's changing, like, you know, th you, the amount you get in a particular pull changes because there's a different delay since you last pulled it. But I know that in advance. Yes. So I'm studying this, the completely this known. Uh, this offline is, problem. This is a scheduling problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's offline. Completely offline problem. Yeah. Um, I will later make it into this bandit 
algorithm. But uh, so then there's this greedy algorithm which just says for each arm, what is the reward I would get if I pulled it today? And this is a function of when I last pulled it, so I, and I know that. So I can follow the greedy policy. And greedy is going to be, uh, could be as bad as half opt. Um, and the positive result is that uh, this is in fact tight. So uh, the ratio of greedy to opt is never less than one half. So greedy is a two approximation and I'll, I'll prove that for you. Do you guys want me to go over the negative results to make sure you understand the problem? Sure. Okay, let's go back a slide then. Uh, so the negative result is saying that uh, it could be as bad as a, a factor two. So greedy is going to say always pull the always play the song for which I have uh, the best payoff today. So you could imagine that the payoff function of the Beatles is uh, if you haven't heard the Beatles in T days, your uh, reward for hearing the Beatles is T. Uh, whereas for Nirvana, if you no matter when you last heard it, your reward is some fixed one minus epsilon. Now the greedy policy is. This is what you, like each each time you pull it, this is what you get. But but each day is just t since the last time. It's not like the sum of the previous days. You're not adding some money to the pile every day. It's yeah. Since last pull. Yeah. Okay. But so if you last pulled it three days ago, you get three dollars. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's what this is. Um. Yes. Uh, the marginal will be little h. <laughs> Uh, so the greedy policy will pull the Beatles all the time and opt will uh, play Nirvana for T time steps allowing the Beatles rewards to accumulate and then pull the Beatles arm and get a total payoff of two uh, T approximately. So this is a half approximation. Great, so uh, the first thing I wanna prove to you is that okay. this is tight. Yes. yes. Uh, I want to prove to you that this is tight, and uh, in order to do that, I am going to define a new policy called enhanced greedy. So the greedy policy has some schedule, maybe it plays the Beatles all the time. Opt has potentially some other schedule, it plays Beatles Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then it plays Nirvana. And the enhanced greedy, I'm going to allow it to pull two arms in one time step. So this is a you know, hypothetical policy that I'm uh, imagining. I can't actually do this, but let's suppose that I allow this enhanced greedy to pull two arms in one time step. And what it's gonna do is it's going to, whenever opt and greedy agree, it's gonna play the arm that they agree on. And when they differ, it will pull both the greedy arm and the opt arm. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Opt is switched. It's in a nirvana and then kills. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's consistent with it. <laughs> You're saying that I, I claimed that one. Yeah. I see. I think you want to play Nirvana, right? Wow. Until the end yeah. and play Beatles. Yeah. Well, this is now like a proof of the positive results. So let's assume that they had totally different payoff functions and this happened to be opt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can I just switch them? You can, you can also, yeah, I mean, so this could be a Nirvana cover. <laughs> this is, you know, John Lennon. <laughs> You're not buying it. <laughs> I've gotten a little lost. Okay. Is, it, is it SP hard, the problem? Um, and we have a PTAS, and we do not know if it's NP hard. Uh, so, okay, so this is the enhanced greedy. It's going to pull the arm that they, if they agree, it pulls the arm that they agree on. And when they disagree, it pulls both arms. And it gets credit for both arms. Uh, and now to prove the two approximation, notice because uh, Greedy is pulling the best arm for that time step, the uh, enhanced, uh, twice Greedy is at least enhanced Greedy because Greedy only gets to pull two arms in each time step. And, uh, enhanced greedy pulls two arms in each time step and greedy is pulling the best of them. Fine. Uh, and then by concavity, so this is where I'm using concavity, uh, I, you know, enhanced greedy might be pulling arms that opt didn't expect to get pulled, 
but that doesn't matter because of concavity, inserting poles in between arms is only helpful. So enhanced greedy is better than opt, and that gives us the two approximation for the greedy scheduling algorithm. Okay, so we want to improve this, and the first idea that we have is to define what we call this rate of return function. And so the rate of return uh, is going to be um, the maximum long run payoff that you can get from arm i if you're allowed to schedule it an x fraction of time steps. So let's just focus on one arm i, and suppose you can schedule it for only an x fraction of time steps, then which time steps would you choose for that arm in order to maximize the uh, value that you get from that arm? That's this function r. Um, and one thing that we can observe about r is that it's concave and piecewise linear. So why is that? Well, the optimal sequence has two distinct gap sizes. In order to prove that, let's suppose there's an optimal sequence that pulls nirvana of four out of, what is this, eight? Uh, so half of the time steps. Uh, and it doesn't have equal gap sizes. Then I can, because of concavity, improve this schedule by equalizing the gap sizes. So I've lost, from going to here to here, I lost a gap size of zero and a gap size of two, but I gained two gap sizes of one, and by concavity this is better. Um, so this is uh, intuition, and, and you, know, you can prove it from here that the uh, RI function is concave and uh, piecewise linear. Why do you get two? Two what? Two gap sizes. Uh, because I'm asking you to do it up to some bound t, so you might not be able to the pack. Last one might be yeah. Long. So you have the same gap up to some time. Yeah. No. 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 Fraction. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it, it depends. Thing. You have to fraction. you have to mix between these two to get to your gap to get to your capital T. If your average is one and a half, you're going to have to have oh. half one and a half. So if x divides n, would it just be one gap? Yeah. Capital. I, I think of t the as my time horizon. Yeah. N is the number of arms. Um, okay, so then that gives me the following concave relaxation. I want to maximize my total reward, which is the sum over each of the arms of the reward of each arm, uh, subject to uh, being able to schedule them. And one, the relaxation now is saying, well, uh, certainly I can't ask for the frequencies to be larger than one, like the sum of the frequencies to be larger than one. That would certainly be not schedulable. So. This is my concave relaxation. I have my piecewise linear R functions, and it's easy to find uh, the solution to this concave relaxation. It gives me the frequencies with which I want to pull each arm. So in this example, it's telling me that I want to pull arm one, one-sixth of the time, arm two, one-third of the time, and arm three, one-half of the time. OK, that's great. Um, I have now the optimal frequencies. And I now need to round this concave program. So I want to get a schedule that hits these target frequencies and pulls each arm i at least one over every one over x i time steps. OK, now this is where we get into this cool combinatorial problem, uh, which I, you can think of as scheduling songs with particular frequencies. Um, this is known as the pinwheel scheduling problem. So here's a puzzle for you. Let's suppose my concave program said I should schedule Nirvana at least every two songs, i.e. its frequency was one half, schedule Beatles every three songs, and schedule Pink Floyd every five songs. Can I do that? Yes. Yeah. OK, how? <laughs> <laughs> Nearest deadline first. Nearest so, deadline first. So you're gonna do you're gonna do Nirvana and then Beatles and then Nirvana and then Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd or, or Beatles. So what exactly do you mean by every? Word? In every uh, interval of length two, you have to have at least one Nirvana. In every interval of length three, you have to have at least one Beatles. They sum to less. They sum to less than one. Yeah. 
That is definitely a constraint. Uh, but you can't do it because in the first 30 songs, you're going to need 15 Nirvanas, 10 Beatles, and 6 Pink Floyds. And that's 31 songs, which is greater than 30. And if you start trying to write it out, say, by this uh, you know, closest deadline first, you'll run into a problem. Uh, OK, so, oh, I'm sorry. I guess those ones sum up to greater than one. <laughs> yes, so that is definitely a constraint. You, they have to sum up to less than one. Here's a, a bunch that sum up to less than one. So if they sum to less than one. Yeah, if they sum to less than one, you should be able to do it. OK, so here you can do it. And this is a schedule. I won't make you guys come up with it. Uh, here is a bunch that sum up to less than one, and you can't do it. Um, so I want to schedule Nirvana every two songs, so every other time step must be Nirvana. And then uh, I have to schedule Beatles every three songs, so I have to have Beatles in between all the Nirvanas, which leaves no time for Pink Floyd. <laughs> I thought about changing out the songs to make them more palatable to you, but <laughs> I thought no one else would recognize it. <laughs> yeah. So in, in in practice, do you like how how binding is this rounding? Oh yeah, that is definitely right. this is an interlude because I don't need to do this exactly, and I will show you how to do it approximately. Right. Presumably, most applications like you're not playing Nirvana every two songs; you're playing it every. 100 songs, and I don't know. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so the famous pinwheel scheduling problem asks, uh, the conjecture is that you can always do it if uh, the sum of frequencies, if and only if the sum of frequencies is less than 5, 6. This is a classic problem with a classic conjecture. Uh, <laughs> People think about it. I don't know. So, <laughs> do you mean? Is this a classic problem? Oh, oh yes, this is the classic conjecture. conjecture. Yes, this is not our conjecture. This is well established in the literature as the classic conjecture. Is the conjecture if and only if? Different what? Is it if and only if? Or? Yes. Wait, is, is possibility known if you decrease by 6 or something? Yes, like uh, one half is obvious. I see nothing that is. Um, one half is obvious because you can uh, do like put it all into a binary tree and um, round everything up and then like one when you round one half up it's still less than one and so now you can do it uh, I think five six is as easy to I, I sorry five six plus epsilon is uh, I showed you on the last slide that's not possible and less than five like getting it to show that this you can do it with five six is the classic conjecture and one, one half is easy and I think people have done something between one half and five six like three quarters I think is known. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if and only if, even though like like one half, one quarter, one quarter would be easy. So oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Which constants ensure that any? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's true that if all your uh, frequencies are powers of two, you can do it. Yeah. And they sum to less than one. Okay, so cute problem, but not super relevant because what I really need to do is round my concave program. Uh, I don't need to solve this problem exactly. Yeah, do you have a question? Pink Floyd songs are too long anyway. Right? <laughs> <laughs> can't wait. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Back to our scheduling problem. <laughs> um, I need to find a, uh, a rounding for my concave relaxation. I have my target frequencies. And here's a way I could do this. I could use independent rounding. At each time step, I'm going to pick an arm independently with probability xi. Okay. Uh, so this is a very natural rounding scheme, and what's it going to do for me? Uh, well, the delay of an arm, let's call that tau sub i, when I pull it, is uh, geometrically distributed, and it has expectation 1 over xi. And so my rounding is going to get 
xi, fraction of the time it's playing arm i. And when it's playing arm i, the distribution is identically distributed across time. It's tau i. So it's getting expectation of my h function of tau i every time I pull it. The uh, relaxation is, in fact, getting xi times hi of, uh, so I, I sort of went over this fast, but I had told you that the ri function is equal to xi of hi of 1 over xi. Uh, and so my relaxation is getting this. So what did I do? I switched the expectation and the h, that's a con h is concave, and so uh, I'm getting a 1 minus 1 over e factor uh, in, through this independent rounding scheme. And intuitively, like, if I want to improve this, what's going wrong is that this uh, random variable, tau i, is too diffuse. I need to, the variance is too high. I need to cut down on the variance to get a stronger uh, approximation here. And so we're, we do this through a technique that we call interleaved rounding. And in interleaved rounding, I'm going to schedule arms in continuous time uh, at a, uh, regular rate. So I'm going to, in continuous time, I'm going to pull arm i exactly every 1 over xi steps. So that's the target delay I'm looking for. And I'm going to uh, push it by a random offset so that arms don't collide. So this is a random offset, say, between 0 and 1. And uh, so uh, that's, that's how I'm scheduling arm i. So for example, I have this purple arm, maybe 1 over xi was whatever the distance is between these purple dots. I schedule it every 1 over xi steps. I do this again for the blue arm and so on for all the arms. And I get some schedule of the arms in continuous time. They don't overlap because of this random offset. Now how do I get from this continuous time world to my discrete time world? I'm going to very simply map uh, the dis continuous time to discrete time by just preserving the order. So that gives me some schedule. And I claim that this is a lower var variance rounding scheme. And that will allow me to improve my approximation. So why is it a lower variance rounding scheme? Well, I'm, now I need to calculate the delay of arm i when I pull it. The delay of arm i is a function of the number of arms that in continuous time end up between two poles of arm i. So for each j, let's let zj be the number of times that arm j ended up between two poles of arm i in continuous time. Uh, well, zj, its expectation is the length of time between two poles of arm i is 1 over xi. And zj is getting, uh, j is getting scheduled an xj fraction of time. So the expectation of zj is this. And you can also, not without too much trouble, argue that it's supported, in fact, on uh, two points. Um, and this is the same argument as before. And so that's great. That's, now what I can do is use this cool definition of an order of random variables that we found in a paper of Kostya and uh, Maxim Stravodenko, uh, which is called the convex stochastic order. Uh, so you say that x is less than y in the convex stochastic order if for every convex function the expectation of that function of x is less than the expectation of that function of y. And it turns out that if x is a sum of independent Bernoullis, which our tau i consists of, and y is Poisson, uh, then uh, x is less than y in the convex stochastic order. And so I have this lemma, which is great, because now I can uh, look at the contribution of arm i in this concave relaxation. I can bound it using this convex stochastic ordering property. My, the thing that the algorithm gets, as before, is the expectation of hi of the uh, random variable, which is its delay. And by the convex stochastic order, remember this is a concave function, so by the convex stochastic order, this is only larger than this thing. Um, and now I can use a fact about concave functions of Poisson random variables to get a proof of a 1 minus 1 over 2e approximation, uh, which is great. 
um, but that's not a great improvement over 1 minus 1 over e. Why do I care? Why I care is because the same technique can be used on small arms only to get me a 1 minus epsilon factor approximation. So here a small arm is an arm that's pulled only an epsilon fraction of, uh, epsilon squared fraction of time steps. And this is very useful because um, I can now def use some sort of brute force search over large arms combined with this concave relaxation plus rounding scheme on the small arms to get a PTAS for my problem. So what do I do? I guess which arms are big, uh, and there's at most one over epsilon squared of them. So I'm thinking of epsilon as a constant here. And I then uh, I also decide how many gaps I want between big arms, in which I'm going to stuff the small arms. And then I, uh, so I search over all such schedules by brute force. And then I use uh, this relaxation that I told you about to stuff the small arms into the gaps between the big arms. So this is a very technical uh, result. I told you the one key piece of it, which is the, um, the uh, concave relaxation that we use for scheduling the small arms. But there's many other things we need to deal with here, like the gaps might not be evenly spaced. Oh, let me stuff the small arms in there. Uh, so the gaps might not be evenly spaced, and we have to deal with that, and we have to make sure that there is a regular scheduling of the, so we only search over periodic schedules of the big arms. We have to make sure that there's a periodic schedule of the big arms that gives us enough payoff. So there's a lot of details. You can look at the paper, which does not exist yet, to <laughs> learn about them. So, uh, quick, quick question. The, uh, I don't get if, does the pinwheel uh, conjecture, does it imply that there is an integrality gap between uh, the relaxation and, and yes. the original form? It does. Yes. So, okay. Yet you can still get to 1 minus 1 over 2e just by rounding the, the relaxation. Uh, I, the gap is not the 5, 6 from that, but we can use pinwheel scheduling to find a gap. Um, and the gap that we find is 16 over 17, I think. With, like, that's the best thing we were able to construct. Uh, so there is a variant of pinwheel scheduling called you know, teach demand scheduling. So you, given these numbers, uh, xi, you can schedule so that at any interval p, the number of uh, pulls of arm i is uh, within one of p times xi. So that's actually a non-trivial fact, but you know, theorem from 1980. So that's almost the pinwheel, but not it doesn't satisfy the condition. And that's possible just provided the sum of the xi is less than 1, so there's no gap for that. And that's this deadline, uh, the nearest deadline first uh, policy. Maybe, uh, yes. Earliest. And what? So? It's more commonly called earliest deadline. Earliest, earliest deadline first. Uh, so earliest deadline first is actually a special case that was discovered in the 70s. Uh, which is only for xi, which are one of integers, and the general case is from 1980. But uh, so I wonder if you plug that into your rounding. Uh, um. so, so that condition looks, you know, like it should be as good as the thing. I mean, I, I need to bound. I need this delay to be. If if I ever have an unbounded delay, I need to. I might lose a lot. Unbounded delay. This is like an unbounded stick. delay. So x, the number of currents differs by no. So the number of currents differs, the differs by at most. <laughs> the number of currents differs by at most one from you know from from what you what you want. So there's never unbounded. No, but there can be an unbounded. Like just in the example of the lower bound, you, you might have to wait. Like one arm, you know, it's just accruing reward. You're not paying it, and you just should pay it once at the last time. So the, the, the time you're waiting depends on the time horizon. I think we should take this offline because I think I'm out of time. But uh, <laughs> I had a whole third section of the talk on unknown payoffs. Um, sure. And let me see what I want to tell you about it. Uh, 
if the payoffs are not known, then you know, I don't have I don't know how to solve this problem optimally, so I'm going to lose some factor in my regret bound. So I'm going to get something like alpha, where alpha is the approximation ratio of whatever algorithm I'm using to solve the offline problem, times opt minus some regret bound that's going to look something like this. And uh, in order to do this, I mean, one problem is that these scheduling algorithms are counting on the future when they decide what to schedule. And so a standard trick to uh, deal with that would be to divide time into planning epochs. And uh, in each epoch, you commit to some scheduling policy, and then you repeat. And OK, so we can do that too. But a uh, bigger challenge is that our approximation algorithms are assuming this h function is concave. But if you want to do something like use upper confidence bounds on what you think these h's are, they're no longer concave, these upper confidence bound functions. And so uh, we need to deal with that. In order to do that, we have a black box, sort of semi-black box reduction. So we uh, define an augmented reality. We say if the algorithm works well in this augmented reality, then uh, there, it will also be uh, work in a regret in a uh, multi-arm bandit world, and I think I will not tell you what the augmented reality is because this bandit version is like a stochastic. It. Yeah. So the H is a function is the uh, expectation of the reward of that arm, mm. and. Then we get some augmented reality properties. If your algorithm satisfies those augmented reality properties, then there's a reduction that you can plug it into to get a low regret algorithm. And as a result, our p task can be plugged in to get a low regret algorithm. So uh, in summary, I, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and so you need to deal with that when you're scheduling your bandits. Uh, the recharging bandit problem, the payout of an arm is an increasing function of the delay when it was last pulled. We have uh, fast approximations that are constant. We also have this p-test, which has a terrible running time because we have to do this brute force search over the large arms. Um, and then you can plug any of these things into our black box learning, uh, which uses upper confidence bounds to reduce to a known payoff case. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks. OK, we have time for a quick uh, Berlin question. Yeah. Is it uh, easy to explain what fact about convex functions of course on random variables you used? Yeah, I used exactly. Oh, you mean to prove that bound? Um, mm -hmm. I, I used this fact. <laughs> I, or I, I, I proved this so in the paper. We, this is a lemma we prove in the paper. I see. Um, I don't have For any, any intuition. concave age? Yes. OK. Yeah? Can you say like a sentence about what your ironing is going to correspond to if it's not too out of the blue without it? It's actually for the uh, PTAS. So the PTAS is working with this R thing. Um, and so it is going to, instead of feeding in this, this should be a, a bar over this thing. So instead of feeding in this thing, it's going to uh, assume the ironed function here. And then the PTAS is going to round based on this ironed function. And it will just never schedule things that have this interior gap. So it's going to push all of the, if, if it wanted to schedule something here, the rounding is going to push it off to the endpoints. And you have to show you don't lose much by that, which is super technical and is the reason the paper is not on archive yet. <laughs> OK, thanks, thank you. Nico, again.